Um, tonight, we will be exploring the intersections between climate change, affordable housing and equity, and the solutions that are available to us. And I will start by, while I am sharing my screen, I, I will impolitely turn off my camera because my Wi-Fi is being a little bit difficult tonight, but I want you all to be able to hear me well. So um, just while I give the little introduction, I will stop my video. Amazing. So hopefully you can still hear me well. So welcome. Like I was mentioning, my name is Daphne. I am the Youth Engagement Coordinator at the Climate Reality Project Canada. And I am speaking today from Jojage, commonly known as Montreal, a site of meaning and exchange among Indigenous peoples. So please use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you were joining from. And please use the chat to also share your observations and comments and use the uh, Q&A box if you have any questions throughout the presentation. We will make sure that we will address them um, at the end of our presentation. Amazing. So before uh, starting, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about this week of action and our organization. So the Climate Reality Project Canada is an organization dedicated to catalyzing a global solution to the climate crisis by making urgent action a necessity across every level of society. So to tackle climate change, we focus on greenhouse gas emissions and on education and grassroots action as the solution. Our approach is therefore rooted in the empowerment of citizens, and we are dedicated to equipping them to be effective catalysts for change in their communities. As you may already know, this webinar is part of our Week of Action programming that is already um, that is geared towards youth. So the Climate Reality Project Canada recognizes the importance that youth have on fighting the climate crisis and that there is a unique opportunity for young people to reimagine their collective future, but also create the change that they seek. So this is why we wanted to address different climate issues that are important to youth um, throughout this week of action, but also shed light on the importance of the climate strike that is happening at the end of our week with a variety of actions, uh, activities and opportunities to take action. So if you are interested in learning more about all of, about all of these events, we have a divestment zap that is happening tomorrow night at 7 p.m. with Banking on a F Better Future. We have a panel where youth will actually talk about their climate concerns and what we can do to solve them on Thursday at 12 p.m. EDT. And finally, we have a fun poster prep session at night at 7 p.m. to collectively prepare our signs for the climate strike of September 24th. So I'll put all of the links in the chat if you wish to register or find more inf information about all of these opportunities. So if you would like also to get involved, um, so let me put that all of that information in the chat for everyone to see uh, where you can you can get involved for the week of action. But also, if you would like to get involved beyond this week of action, please head to the Climate Reality website to learn more about all of our various programs. So one of which is our Global Training of Climate Reality Leaders, a worldwide community of over 37,000 climate, 37, climate reality leaders trained by Al Gore to lead change through compelling communication and impactful action. We also make impact at the municipal level through our network of community climate hubs. Our National Climate League is an exercise in open data, providing a platform for cities across Canada to track and compare their progress on a variety of climate indicators. And finally, we have our new Campus Core program, which provides students with a platform and guidance to lead effective climate action within their campus communities. Again, I'll put in the chat all of the resources that would be useful to know um, how, on how to get involved and where you can find all of that information on our website. Amazing. So that will be in the chat in just a few seconds. Um, but all right, so enough talking for now. So now it is um, my pleasure and honor to introduce you to our speakers for the night. First, we will welcome our first speaker, Julieta Peruca. Julieta is an experienced researcher and human rights activist. She holds a law degree from Maastricht University, a degree in international and European law, and a, and a degree in political science from the University of Ottawa. She has been expertly trained in the area of the right to housing, and as a deputy director of the SHIFT, she facilitates engagement with the SHIFT network. Julieta leads the work on housing and climate change for the SHIFT. 
Laurent Lévesque is our second speaker of the night. Laurent is the executive director and co-founder of the L'Unité de Travail pour l'Implantation du Logement Étudiant, a nonprofit organization that has developed a unique model for affordable student housing in Canada. He is also president of the board of directors of Chantier de l'Economie Sociale. Thank you, Laurent, for being here tonight. So we'll, we'll introduce, we'll start with Julieta. So welcome, Julieta. The floor is all yours. Amazing. Hi everyone, let me just uh, quickly start my screen or share my screen. I also have to apologize because I'm a little bit fatigued from the election yesterday and for us it's been a really busy week of election stuff so I apologize in advance if you see me a little bit discombobulated but I am so pleased to be here with all of you today for the beginning of climate action week. Um, I, I want to say that I am myself not a climate expert, as Daphne said, I am a human rights advocate and I work specifically in the area of the right to housing. But leading the climate work for our organization, I have had the pleasure to go to COP24 COP, and COP25 and I'm hoping to go to COP26 in Glasgow. Um, but there I've been mostly working on issues of uh, how climate change is affecting informal settlements around the world. Um, and it's never really been so specific about Canada. So you're going to see me jumping in and out uh, from the global context that I normally work in to more the specific Canadian context. Um, I think today I, I, I'm supposed to speak for about 30 minutes. Not sure I'll speak for the entire 30 minutes, um, but I'm going to quickly tell you a little bit about what the shift is and what we do as an organization. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the right to housing and how that affects housing affordability. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what is driving the housing crisis that I think all of us are experiencing. And then finally, how that intersects with climate change and why these two issues are so intimately related. Um, yeah, so with that, let me start to tell you a little bit about the shift. Uh, so the shift is an international human rights organization, which is really at the intersection of housing, finance and public policy. I co founded the shift with Leilani Farha, who is the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to housing. And in that position, basically, she acted as a global watchdog for the right to housing. So her role was to travel around the world and kind of try to figure out what is affecting uh, people's enjoyment of the right to housing and kind of what's leading or what's driving the global housing crisis currently. And I think in that role for both of us, so I worked with her when she was in that role, um, it became really clear to us that we kind of had abandoned the understanding of housing as a social good, as something that has really a function in our lives. It's a place that we call home. It's where we raise our families. It's where we prepare for school. We do our homework. It's where we make our meals. And now during the pandemic, you can imagine it's our gym, it's our home office. It's literally been so central to all of our lives, but we don't really understand it that way anymore. I think fundamentally what we understand housing is as a commodity first and foremost, it's a place to leverage profit. It's a place to create wealth. Um, it's really now a cornerstone of our economy. And I think, I don't know, all of a sudden now housing is understood as something akin to gold or oil and definitely not something that's understood as a human right. But we, in this role, we kind of quickly also understood that there were some global forces that were driving our, our understanding of housing as a commodity and that were affecting countries all over the world and making cities and communities unaffordable. They're driving up homelessness. They were increasing rates of evictions. So we felt that in order to respond adequately to the global forces that, that were driving the housing crisis, we also needed to be global in nature and act as kind of a platform to convene a diverse number of actors together in order to start working to, to change, fundamentally change our paradigm and understanding on how we view housing. Um, I think when we were trying to figure out what the shift was going to look like, we actually did look at the Climate Reality Project as and the way that the Climate Reality Project was structured as it was really, really inspirational to us. So it does kind of feel pretty full circle for me to be speaking to all of you today. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited and, and I feel it's such a privilege to be here with you. 
Um, so I think I, I wanted to kind of give you guys an understanding of what the right to housing is um, and how that leads to affordability. So we never talk about housing affordability alone because housing affordability is just a symptom of a housing system that's not working and that's not human rights compliant. Um, so very simply, the, the right to housing means the right to live in peace, security and dignity. So it's a very simple measure to figure out whether the right to housing is being enjoyed. And I mean, just to give you kind of a description of what that looks like is if you're living in homelessness and you have no place to go to the toilet or to shower, obviously your ability to live in dignity is greatly affected and therefore you are currently experiencing a, a human rights violation. If you are living in a place and you're constantly in fear of being evicted or being rent evicted, you're not able to live in security and therefore your right to housing is severely affected. So those are just some quick examples to make you understand what the right to housing is. Um, according to international human rights law standards, there are seven characteristics of the right to housing, which I've laid out here in the slide. I'm just going to talk about affordability because it's kind of what's central to our discussion today. Um, so in order for the right to housing to be realized, it needs to be affordable, of course. So if we're spending 90% of our income towards our housing costs, and we no longer have the ability to uh, pay for food, pay for daycare costs, pay for school costs, then obviously we're not living in affordable in affordable housing. Julieta, I'm yeah. so sorry. I'm hearing. I'm just seeing some comments that we some um, have some difficulties to hear you. That your voice is a little oh. bit garbled. I don't know if there's if there's anything that can be done on that end. But um, yeah, we're just having a little bit of difficulty to to hear you. Let me see if I disconnect my headphones if it works. Okay, great. Yeah, let's try that. Thank you. Let's try this. I might have to stop sharing my screen for a sec. That's actually, that sounds actually a lot better now. I don't know. It is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On my end, it is. Great. Let me keep going. Yeah, is that good? You can still, now you can see the yeah. presentation again. Okay. That's perfect. perfect. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Thanks for telling me. And I'm sorry, I can't see the chat because I have the presentation going. Ah, but okay, so so I was just going into what affordability means. So normally what we define as affordable is what is affordable for the household income. Normally how governments define affordability is what the market can bear as affordable. So you can see what a huge discrepancy that is. Uh, so in the Canadian context, a lot of governments define affordability as 80% of market rent, which you can imagine in a city like Toronto is not at all affordable to what most people are actually earning. Um, normally we define affordability as 30% of household income. And I mean, that's kind of a loose figure. So what we say normally is 30% is kind of a good benchmark, but you can imagine if maybe you're spending 50% of your household income on your housing costs, but you have the ability to eat because you live close to your aunt or your parents or whatever, you have the ability to eat three or four nights out of the week there, then your food costs will be less. So that goes into your housing costs. So there's, there's a bit of a kind of a flexibility about what housing affordability means. But, but what's not flexible is that affordability has to be defined by your own household income and not what the market dictates as affordable. Um, so that's, that's just to give you kind of a sense of the definition of what we mean by affordability according to the human rights framework. I think what's really valuable about the right to housing, and I'll get into this more when we're talking about the climate change intersection, is that the, the right to housing and the human rights framework is also a form of governance. Um, so like climate change, when uh, governments are making any type of policy decisions, they need to ensure that those policy decisions are actually working towards realizing the right to housing and not impeding the enjoyment of the right to housing. And that extends beyond just housing policy. So when we think about 
budgetary decisions, for example, we need to try to figure out whether governments are actually spending as much as they should be spending on affordable housing in comparison to their police budgets, if it's a local government, to their military spending, if it's a federal government. So then we can use the human rights framework as a way of assessing whether governments are actually doing what they need to do in order to secure the right to housing. Um, the other really important part about the right to housing is that it acts as an accountability mechanism. So um, within the international law framework, governments have signed up to uphold the right to housing in so many different international treaties and some regional treaties as well. Uh, the right to housing is also present in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is considered a peremptory norm and therefore binds all countries to it. Uh, the Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights is, is the international treaty that codifies the right to housing most strongly, and that's been signed by over 120 countries. Uh, over 80 countries have the right to housing actually embedded in their constitution. And in Canada, in 2019, the Liberal government actually passed the National Housing Strategy Act, which for the first time uh, enshrined the right to housing in national legislation and the government committed to upholding the progressive realization of the right to housing according to its international human rights law obligations. So because, because the right to housing is such a codified law, because it's so entrenched in our human rights law framework, it actually acts as an accountability mechanism. It's a way in which we can hold government's feet to the fire when they're not doing what they need to do in order to secure the right to housing. So that's another part. I mean, this is also why the Paris Agreement was also so important for the climate change work that we did, was because it was a way to hold governments accountable to their commitments. So very similarly, this is this is um, this kind of mirrors that, but it's older and it's more embedded in different treaties as well as national constitutions. Um, so before we get into the intersection between climate change, I think we really need to understand what's driving our housing crisis and and what's yeah what's really causing this huge issue of housing unaffordability, not only in Canada but really around the world. So as I said, housing is really not treated as a social good anymore. It's treated as a commodity. Um, governments in that vein have really stepped away from housing. They don't see themselves as housing providers anymore. And they've really allowed private actors to take over housing supply, kind of on the basis, or maybe on the, if we give them full credit, they might've done this on the understanding that the housing market when, when led by private actors would respond to basic supply and demand economics, meaning that private actors would be keen on creating housing for low-income families if it's felt that there's demand within low-income families. Sorry, everyone. It's the perils of working from home. Um, but of course, housing does not respond to classic economic ideas of supply and demand. And housing prices, high housing prices, are not at all a result of supply shortages, even if that's what has been said over and over again in the last election period. Supply shortages are not actually affecting house high housing prices. During the pandemic, we've had the slowest population growth since World War I, and we've had the most number of houses built in more than a decade. And despite this, housing prices in the last year went up 27%. And this is really just a longer trend because since 2000, prices have gone up 160%. And with it has housing supply. So housing supply has, has kept up pace because the prices have gone up. And really new housing has actually exceeded household growth for most of the 21st century. And we currently have quite a, a big stock of vacancy rates, even though that's not often what we see reflected in our rental markets. So we have enough housing supply, we're creating a lot of housing as it stands, but we still have a quarter of a million people in Canada living in homelessness every year. It's 500,000 people in the United States. 
In Canada, we still have 1.6 million people who are living in core housing need. So how can the current level of affordability be tolerated, putting so many renters and seniors and young people at risk? I think in order to understand this discrepancy and what's going on, why, why we have this, this housing crisis and this unaffordability crisis, we need to understand that it's not really domestic factors that are necessarily affecting our housing prices and our ability to live in affordable housing. Global real estate, so real estate worldwide accounts for 217 trillion US dollars and residential real estate itself, so our homes where we live, comprise of $163 trillion, which represents uh, more than twice of the world's total GDP. So we have banks, pensions, hedge funds, private equity firms, real estate investment trusts, who are seeking out housing as a safe haven to park excess capital. And they're often benefiting from favorable tax rates and a lack of transparency that is actually being provided by our governments. So the influx of capital then increases housing prices in so many cities to the level that most residents can't afford. And it's not at all commensurate with our household income levels. Instead, it's actually being driven by demand for housing assets among investors and the investor class. So when house, housing prices skyrocket, low and middle income residents are often forced out of communities because of either high rents or mortgage costs. We have seen a huge problem in youth in the youth population all over the world, in places like Italy, for example, where youth or people aged between 20 and 35 aren't able to leave their parents' homes for a new home. And, and this is happening in Italy and Spain and so many pl places, and it's not necessarily driven by cultural norms, it's also driven by housing prices. Um, I think one of the things that i mean one of the things that's central to the housing crisis now is that our governments have favored the interests of financial institutions and have favored economic interests over the needs of those who are struggling to afford a home so it's a pretty critical situation and it's now made even more critical and more urgent when we look at how it intersects with climate change we often say in our work that climate change and access to adequate housing are the two most pressing issues that are facing our society today. And I think unfortunately, these conversations and, and these two issues run on parallel courses and they're never actually fully integrated. And they need to be because they're fundamentally linked. I think to begin with, uh, there's the first very practical fact that natural disasters are di disproportionately impacting those living in housing vulnerability, particularly those living in informal settlements, encampments, and in homelessness. But then you can also think about how those living in unaffordability can, who have not been able to pay for high heating costs or for air conditioning. I think in the I mean, even in the, in this last summer, in the last couple of months, we saw the amount of people in Canada that died from overheating because their apartments were not fit to tolerate the amount of heat that they were living in. And what happened in Canada is happening all over the world. We also see it often every winter. And the more dramatic the winters become, particularly places like Europe that are now getting winters that are more and more extreme, we see people living in homelessness that are dying because they're just not prepared to deal with the extreme, extreme weather and because they're not able to get into permanent affordable housing. Um, we have flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, and other extreme weather events that destroy temporary housing and informal settlements. We have rising sea levels that threaten millions of people living in informal settlements and on coastlines. And then those living in homelessness, as I said, are increasingly dying because of extreme cold or heat. The other issue around vulnerability that this creates is that these extreme weather patterns are also leading to higher levels of migration. So the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center estimates that 40.5 million 
new displacements took place in 2020 alone. And of these, 30.7 million were triggered by disasters. So migrants and refugees are some of the most prone to experiencing repeated and traumatizing human rights violations. So we can really only imagine how their rights will be affected as this crisis hurdles out of control. And as the housing market becomes harder and harder to access, governments are often less likely to provide housing for migrants and refugees because it creates a lot of tension and backlash between the domestic populations. Um, so I think, so that, that's the one side, which is the vulnerability that is exacerbating and, and it is really hurtling out of control. And it's not just for, for low income communities, it's really extending to the middle class as well. And it's definitely extending to the youth. Um, but then as governments are trying to deal with climate change through mitigation and adaptation measures, because there are no human rights oversight mechanisms to these mitigation and adaptation measures, they often also lead to human rights violations. So I haven't personally encountered any mitigation measures that have led to violations of the right to housing here in Canada, but I have uh, met people all over the world that have experienced very serious human rights violations as a result of mitigation measures. I met with indigenous peoples from the Amazon and from Kenya, uh, forest dwellers in particular, who had been evicted from their forest, of which they have been living in for centuries, and not only living, but maintaining, and who are considered, they're considered the stewards of the forest, have been evicted from these forests, often with violence and leading to deaths, as a result of conservation projects that were funded by European countries and European banks. And this all happens as a result of the fact that there are no human rights oversight mechanisms to ensure that our adaptation and mitigation policies are truly in compliance with human rights and not leading to further human suffering. This, this point, I think in particular, is really important ahead of the COP20 negotiations. Um, we know that what is being one of the most important issues that is being negotiated at COP26 is the carbon market. Uh, the global carbon market. So I think from an advocacy perspective, um, and I know this is kind of going outside of the scope of my presentation, but I urge if you guys are all advocates, I urge you to keep this in mind from an advocacy perspective, every time we're talking about, at, about carbon markets, um, about mitigation projects, we need to be demanding that there's human rights oversight mechanisms attached to all of these, particularly at the international level, so that efforts to mitigate climate change don't result in egregious human rights violations like the forced evictions of Indigenous peoples or low-income communities. Um, I think another thing that's worrying about this intersection between climate change and the housing crisis is that there is obviously this, it, it, it's an important drive to adapt our current housing stock and, and curb emissions that are emanating from our housing stock. This is of utmost most importance. We definitely need to do this. Um, but we also understand that governments who are currently embarking in projects to ensure that housing stock is, um, is leading towards zero emissions in the coming years. They're not doing this with any type of human rights oversight mechanisms, which is leaving renters in particular vulnerable to rent evictions. And that's a huge problem because there are huge sums of money that are being spent now on our housing stock. And we, we cannot allow for this really important measure, which is to retrofit our housing stocks, uh, to actually drive unaffordability and evictions, particularly of renters and low income communities. So that's also something that's very much on our radar, which we're trying to work with governments on to ensure that they have both of the, these ideas in mind. So normally when governments are thinking about curbing emissions, they're not actually thinking about what in, in, in the housing sector in particular, they're not actually thinking about what effects that's going to have on affordabil affordability and what effects that's going to have on evictions. So that's really important. And I think it's a kind of a nice segue to discuss the final point on this issue, which is uh, kind of piercing through this argument of supply and demand. So 
it's really important to understand that housing is not only impacted by climate, but climate is also impacted by housing. Many governments kind of solutions to the housing crisis are rooted in creating more supply and opening up housing markets as investment opportunities. I think these solutions therefore rely on the construction sector, both to develop new homes and to renovate those purchased as investments so that they can make them more profitable. And we need to understand that the construction sector is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases globally, which contributes to around 38% of total emissions. So we really can't accept this supply shortage argument as feasible in our modern world when we're looking to solutions for the housing crisis because we know that it's actually not going to solve the housing crisis. If we look in any city in Canada, I'm sure you're going to see cranes all over the skyline. So we know that housing is getting built and that's not at all impacting our housing crisis. In fact, in Canada, despite this increase in supply, we still have increased levels of homelessness and unaffordability and evictions. So when we think about, for example, the Canadian election, every single party had a number that they wanted to reach of affordable housing. So the Conservatives pledged to build a million units in, in three years. The Liberals pledged 1.4 million in four years. The NDP pledged 500,000. At no point did any of these parties talk about the impact of building that many units on their carbon emissions. And I don't know about you, I don't know about all of the people that are attending this discussion today, but I also never saw any media or any groups actually criticize the parties to say, this isn't, we cannot build our way out of the housing crisis if we are to stick to the commitments that we've made under the, the Paris Agreement. These two things are diametrically opposed to each other. So we need to think about new solutions and we need to figure out a way out of the housing crisis that's not gonna be through more carbon emissions through the construction industry. And I can't really, really stress this point enough. <laughs> um, I know that I am going to work really hard now in with this new government to make them understand this intrinsic connection between making sure that we find solutions to the housing crisis and making sure that they are in compliance with our, our obligations under the Paris Agreement. And I just urge everybody to do the same. Um, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking for solutions to the housing crisis. We definitely should be. They just shouldn't be through the through more construction. Um, I think just to highlight this point, uh, the International Energy Agency has said that that in order that carbon emissions need to fall by fifty percent by twenty thirty, which would equate to around a 6% fall of emissions uh, globally. So this is, this is, I mean, imagine if we need to actually be cutting emissions in the construction sector, we cannot afford to build more homes to build our way out of the housing crisis. So these two issues are intrinsically linked. As I've said, I don't think they're explored enough as, as much as they should be. Um, so it's something that I urge all of the advocates on this call to keep in mind. And then I think one of the last things that I will say kind of around this intersection, and I don't have an answer to this. I'm just putting this out there as well, because I know that there are advocates on this call, which is to say that um, we need to talk about global finance. Uh, the climate change movement has been fairly successful at urging uh, sovereign funds, pension funds, et cetera, to divest from oil and gas and reinvest in green energy and be very cognizant about where they're investing their money. And I think that this is an incredible solution and it's and it, I think it's key to ensuring that investments are part of the solution for climate change and not a continuing part of the problem. This is something that we're trying to emulate in the housing world as well. But one of the things that's becoming clear is as people are divesting, there is more floating capital in the world that's finding its way into our real estate markets. 
So I guess my question in this, and I, I do hope we can have a discussion about this at the end of the call, is really how can we make sure that money that is being divested from dirty investments isn't just ending up in our housing markets and feeling unaffordability? And what role do our governments have to play in that? Um, yeah, so I think I'm just going to conclude uh, by saying that I think we can probably get into some more detailed solutions around our discussion. And I think uh, my esteemed co-panelist is going to have some very concrete solutions about housing affordability, which I really look forward to hearing. Uh, but I, I do really want to say that that we can't keep our conversations on housing and our conversations on climate change held separately and in separate venues and to separate audiences. I think these two conversations really need to come together. And I think when we recognize the inter interdependence between environmental and social sustainability, it allows us to, to really understand that everyone must be included. And especially if we're going to ensure a just transition, I think that if we fail to meet our climate targets, it is going to be those living in homelessness, those unable to secure affordable and permanent housing, those living in tent cities or informal settlements that are going to pay the biggest price for our failure. And I think conversely, we know that without human rights oversight, government policy in the area of climate change may act as a driver of the housing crisis. It may fuel evictions and it may fuel housing affordability. And we can't let either of these two things happen. So I think with that, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I am really, really grateful to be able to be here and to discuss with this with all of you today. And, I, and I'm so open to collaborating with all of you moving forward on the intersection of these two issues. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julieta. That was um, really incredibly interesting. And I have so many questions for you, <laughs> but we will wait until the end because you must all be wondering kind of what are the solutions to all of the um, issues that we raised with Julieta. And I think that we will be exploring that a little bit with Laurent. Um, Laurent will be able to, yeah, give us a little bit of more information on the solutions that are available to, to us. But um, again, thank you so much for your presentation. That was incredibly interesting. And um, don't worry for, for anyone that has questions we will be um, taking them at the end of our presentation. So thank you. Thank you again. So Laurent, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, thank you, Julieta, for a very strong um, first act. Uh, I think the uh, table is really set for the discussion um, I want to bring to the floor. So my name is Laurent. Uh, I represent an organization called UTIL. Uh, funny story, if we had an English language acronym, it would be Student Housing Innovation and Facilitation Task Force, so the shift. So I think we're very clearly in uh, on the same page here uh, with the discussion we just had. Um, I was initially, initially planning to talk to you about uh, building our way out of the housing crisis, but uh, I've just been convinced that that's not a, right, a good solution. Um, no, just kidding. I'm, I want to talk to you about non-market housing as in my opinion, in my professional and both and personal and militant opinion, uh, the, the, the best solution, if not the only one, to some of the issues uh, we've just heard from. Uh, so when I think about uh, non-market housing, I think about uh, an issue, a solution that's at the intersection, as we just saw, of lots of different questions, uh, both issues of climate justice, of right to housing, and also uh, broadly other issues of social justice, um, such as uh, quality of life, uh, equity, and the like. Uh, so let me just start right off by talking about what I mean by non-market non -market housing. So um, a lot of the, and I think uh, Julieta also uh, explained this pretty well, uh, there's a lot of problems with what governments are currently calling affordable housing. A lot of that is defined by affordability compared to market values. And a lot of that is developed by for-profit developers for temporary affordability, uh, which really changes nothing in the, um, in the whole market. So uh, I'm going to 100% uh, agree with the fact that uh, not only can we, uh, not only is the housing crisis not an issue of supply and demand, 
uh, we believe the problem is the structure of the supply itself, which is entirely uh, or almost entirely in Canada operated at a profit. Uh, and this means that even if, for example, you have a, an affordable condo, for example, which some developers will uh, pretend to build, um, well, it can be affordable the first time it's sold, but then sold the year a year after for 100% markup, and then it's not affordable anymore. So non-market housing is permanently affordable housing. It does not have any of the for profit incentives of traditional um, uh, housing models and structures. And it essentially aims to operate a decommodification of housing. So we heard about how it's a problem that uh, housing is treated more and more. And it's true that this is becoming uh, a, a very uh, preoccupying and global trend of seeing housing as a commodity, seeing a, a financialization of the uh, housing market. Uh, big equity firms, big uh, investment uh, funds moving into residential um, assets, while non-market housing aims to really reverse that trend uh, and also have assets that are protected from those trends and pressures and incentives in the future. Uh, I use the broad term of non-market housing because in practice it relates, it refers to lots of different diverse models of housing. I'm going to talk to you about a few of them um, in a few minutes. Uh, and But it also um, banks on different forms, different ways of financing uh, housing than the traditional for-profit model uh, involves. And it also redistributes power differently than uh, for-profit housing. So these are three things that I'm going to be um, uh, unpacking uh, with you in the next few minutes. Uh, but in summary, what we need to remember now is that non-market housing is affordable, yes, in perpetuity. It's also non-speculative, so it really removes the, uh, the speculation, the, basically the, 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 all the wrong incentives of capitalism from the housing market, and it can be democratic, it can redistribute power. So here are some models. There's the, the, this is something that's um, been existing, obviously, obviously, for a very long time. Uh, even before uh, we saw the, the commodification that we're seeing right now uh, happen. Uh, the, more, the most traditional model maybe that people will uh, recognize is that of social housing. So social housing or public housing um, is one very traditional approach where uh, the government finances and builds uh, subsidized housing for typically very low income families. Housing cooperatives are another different model, sometimes subsidized, sometimes not, uh, where um, people come together to own their home collectively. So they don't have a landlord, they are collectively organized as a co-op that is basically uh, their own landlord. Housing nonprofits are similar models that come in different shapes and sizes often will aim to uh, meet the housing needs of a specific population, for example, low-income seniors or the like. Uh, and finally, you have community land trusts that um, remove the speculation from the, uh, the land uh, of a specific neighborhood, for example, or area, uh, and will control the appreciation and value of the buildings that are built on top of them. So therefore, allowing other forms of housing to coexist with a non-speculative um, objective. There's another completely other side to uh, decommodification of housing um, that is market regulation. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much today, for one, because it's not my uh, specialty or my profession. I'm an affordable housing developer, uh, not a market regulator, uh, but also for two, because that's, uh, there's much less uh, levers for activists and uh, citizens to act on that, aside from requiring that of governments. Definitely market regulation and fiscal policy and, and money policy are also deeply involved with the evolution of rents, uh, market values, and the like. And so play into the, the, the deepening issues of commodification of housing. Um, but there's a, a, another, that's another uh, rabbit hole to jump into at a later time. Um, so I'm going to talk to you now about one example of non-market housing. 
I chose the lazy option and I chose to talk to you about the organization I run, uh, which is called UTIL. So our work is to build affordable student housing. Uh, we operate throughout the province of Quebec. Um, basically what we do is we build housing. I, I agreed with the fact that we don't need to build our way out of the housing crisis, but uh, in our case, our goal is to provide student housing. So we need to increase the offering. And basically what we do is we replace condo projects, uh, which is one of my um, greatest uh, sources of uh, pleasure. Uh, this year is was gonna be 13 stories of condo uh, for-profit expensive luxury apartments in front of Montreal's nicest urban park. We replaced that with 90 units of affordable stu uh, student housing uh, with uh, more sustainable wood frame construction, lower carbon impact, uh, better, obviously, quality of life for students than a lot of the slum-like conditions that they're forced to live in because of housing and affordability. And we're ensuring affordable housing, not only for students now, but for generations of future students in that neighborhood in Montreal. Uh, so this is a, the, this building that I'm talking about now uh, was actually built in 2020. So it's a very recent uh, effort. It's the first of its type, but our mission is to uh, accelerate the development uh, of affordable student housing. So we have other projects under construction in Quebec. Um, this one is part of an eco neighborhood uh, in Montreal, uh, which this project is under construction. It's going to be 120 apartments um, with uh, very, very high standards of environmental design. And we're also working on another project in another city of Quebec. And this one we're aiming to achieve uh, a carbon neutral development, um, which is very ambitious. Uh, Julieta was right to say that new construction is a significant driver of carbon emissions. Uh, but as a nonprofit developer, we have the opportunity to pursue bold uh, new strategies because we're not trying to increase our profits, we're trying to reduce our footprint. So I'll get back to those benefits in a few minutes. Uh, so that's just one example. Um, the, the forms of affordable non-market housing differ uh, widely. Uh, they're always very often adapted to their context. That's one of the beauty of the democratic uh, component. You'll find um, indigenous housing providers developing culturally specific projects. There's a lot of them on the West Coast. You'll find uh, rural uh, projects that have a very different approach than more urban uh, designs and cooperative projects that are designed on community living also have a different architectural form than um, other, for example, social housing projects, some of which have unfortunately uh, favored cost control in the past. Uh, but all of these projects have to be financed somehow. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of non-market housing financing, but I will say that um, they require funding as any uh, real estate project. And that's true even, either if you're building uh, affordable housing or if you're converting existing housing to non-market use or non-market structures, which uh, I think is as an important strategy as uh, increasing the supply of affordable housing, obviously uh, due to the reasons we've already spoken about. So one of the big traditional sources of funding for affordable housing is public funding. Uh, social housing is essentially funded 100% by the state. Um, but you'll also see lots of projects involving private funding and uh, local communities in lots of different ways. And I want to take a minute to focus on the private funding part, um, in part because I think that's one of the uh, critical elements of reorganizing the power piece, but also because of what Julieta said about uh, the, the tie between divestment campaigns and uh, the, the commodification and the financialization of housing. Non-market housing is a great uh, solution to that problem as well, because it requires significant capital, uh, but it requires that capital to play the game differently. Uh, so the capital that's flowing into the residential real estate world and destroying our communities is capital that comes in uh, as equity, expects very high returns, 
and wants to make profit off of the assets it holds. So uh, an increase in rents, for example, if they're holding rentals, directly increases their return. But that's, in a nutshell, the uh, problems with capitalism applied to uh, housing. And what we're doing in the non-market housing sector is we're, um, dive, we're, we're attracting private investments. We, uh, our projects are typically funded between 20 to 80% from private sources, um, but they have to play by the rules of community use and social benefits. So returns are capped. Uh, there's no variable interest depending on how much money projects are making. And uh, they, there is no profit. There is no uh, benefit for investors to, um, for example, renovate or increase rents to increase their profit. The, there's money that's borrowed from private investors, so it's debt, and they don't own the, um, the property. They're not shareholders. They're not speculating on the future value of the asset. They're simply uh, lending some money to a non-market organization that holds the asset and operates it for social good. Uh, and this is critical. This is a critical piece. I hope I'm not boring you with the, the financial aspects, but uh, this is very critical because that means that it is possible to uh, divert some capital and hopefully a growing amount of it into uh, social good through affordable housing, uh, non-market housing, which is a capital intensive sector. And if you design your power and funding structures well, you won't repeat the same problems that you have of seeing Blackstone or huge private equity firms uh, swooping in to um, essentially uh, increase the, the market pressures on housing, whereas non-market housing aims to reduce them. Um, which leads me to talk about the question of power. Um, so in uh, the for-profit, uh, housing market. Housing is a commodity. That means housing is privately owned, either by um, small, sc small scale owners owning a single family homes or a small uh, apartment building, or increasingly so, and that's particularly worrying, by those large scale investment firms and private equity groups and the like uh, that see housing as just another asset class or investment vehicle to uh, produce very high returns for their generally uh, very rich investors. Um, in that environment, they hold all the power. So when you want to increase your returns, you renovate and you squeeze your tenants out because uh, you have the power as the landlord. All of these forms of non-market housing replace that uh, private ownership structure by something else. It's not always the same answer, but that shift in power, I think, is very important to stress because it's as important as the shift in finances. Otherwise, you risk repeating the same uh, wrong incentives. Uh, so in public housing, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, it's typically state owned or at least state funded. Initially in Canada, the government, the federal government was financing public housing until the 1990s. Uh, and then transferred that to the provinces. And now in most provinces, it's uh, the provinces transferred that to municipalities. So in most cases, uh, whatever public housing is left is operated by um, cities or city offices. Cooperative housing, uh, as I also mentioned earlier, is collectively owned by the tenants. So you never get renovated from a, a housing co-op because you are represented as an owner as much as a tenant. Um, so. I've never heard of a renovation in a housing co-op, and I don't think it's uh, likely to ever happen. Uh, and it's democratic. So if uh, there was, for example, a manager that decided they would do something uh, crazy like that, well, the board, entirely composed of tenants, would uh, re probably remove them. Uh, another form is nonprofit housing, uh, typically run by volunteers. This can be more diverse than uh, housing co-ops, which are typically a more standard model. Uh, in our example, in the example of my organization, we are a nonprofit organization. Our board, our board is composed of a mix of students, tenants, uh, and uh, external volunteers bringing real estate expertise. So it's a mix of uh, uh, tenant or stakeholder representatives. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, community land trusts typically are run by representatives of a wider neighborhood uh, to ensure that land use in that trust um, is put to the maximum community benefit. Uh, speaking of benefits, there's a lot of great benefits to non-market housing. Uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, some of them coming already. I just want to take a few minutes to uh, walk through some of the main ones I think uh, are important to stress after the, um, the, the problems we've heard from Julieta. Uh, so first, of course, protecting housing from speculation means that not only are these affordable options affordable now, uh, but they're a, a key, a cornerstone element of protecting future generations from similar housing prices as the one we're facing now. Housing prices tend to be uh, cyclical, as uh, does the market economy in general. And every time it's the more vulnerable uh, populations that uh, pay the price, literally. So uh, in the last two years, we've seen rents in many Canadian cities go up 10, 20 percent. In non-market housing, they've remained the same. If they increase, it's only tied to inflation. Uh, having that affordable, that access to uh, a housing they can afford, essentially having the right to housing, uh, means households have more choices on where they can live. More household mobility means they can live in neighborhoods that are accessible in public transit, more uh, accessible to work opportunities. And you really avoid one of the worrying phenomenons we're seeing where gentrification drives lower income households outside of central neighborhoods and into less expensive, but less poorly, uh, more poorly um, uh, serviced uh, suburbs. And this in turn drives uh, urban sprawl with very, very severe uh, climate effects. Um, removing the prof profit incentives can also lead to higher quality urban developments. Uh, instead of trying to make as much profit, maximizing profit uh, on any single piece of land by being, building as many floors of luxury condos as possible, non-market developers, if they build new construction or if they renovate existing stock, always have a mission to steer their uh, housing and eventually their other um, other commercial spaces, for example, towards social needs and not towards maximum profit. And this can meet lots of other uh, urban challenges on top of access to housing. Uh, and finally, removing that short-term uh, profit incentives that most uh, construction developers have and replacing that with a more uh, long-term stewardship approach to housing where non-market organizations hold their assets in perpetuity. The buildings we build or buy at Util are held as affordable housing for hundreds of years in the future, creates very interesting incentives for energy savings instead of just trying to uh, reduce as much as possible the quality of the condos you're building and charging the highest price possible. Um, and one of the interesting uh, possibilities that that opens up is to actually uh, take into account the real important indicators such as the actual carbon emissions of a construction rather than going for some of the more flashy uh, marketing options as you'll see in a lot of um, for-profit developers that claim to be doing uh, green construction and stuff like that so that they can market and up price their um, uh, their new constructions to uh, uh, sensitive uh, clients that want to know they're doing something good for the planet. And I think one very uh, striking example of that is that the leading um, green building certification lead does not take into account the construction materials you're using in your building. So whether you build a wood frame construction, which is actually a carbon sink, or a concrete construction, which has huge carbon emissions, uh, it doesn't change your points whether you're considered a green construction or not. And one of the reasons for that is that a lot of condo buyers prefer a concrete construction because they get better soundproofing and insulation. Uh, so I think removing uh, all of the profit incentives and replacing that with long-term stewardship, community uh, accountability, and other forms of democratic organization of housing and 
urban development can really shift uh, practices in the way we think of, the way we plan, and the way we build our cities. Uh, and if we achieve that type of, of scale, what would it look like? Uh, well, I just wanted to give you one example from outside of Canada that I think uh, is striking, and it's Vienna. So this is a photo uh, that I chose because it has a lot of trees of uh, one project, one uh, neighborhood in Vienna. But it's not about this specific neighborhood. It's about the fact that in this city, uh, in Austria, over 60% of households live in non-market housing. They live in either public housing or cooperative housing, which each have about 30% of the market, leaving only 40% to private for-profit firm, uh, for-profit forms of home ownership, uh, which I didn't have the time to pull out the numbers, but in Canada, we're talking about about 99% of our real estate market uh, being for-profit and maybe one, maybe 2% uh, of our housing stock being non-market. Um, this leads uh, Vienna to be one of the cities in the world with the highest quality of life for its uh, residents. Uh, often at the top of the charts. Uh, the, this publicly funded housing development leads to very uh, intentional urban designs with many experimental green neighborhoods, uh, some of them car-free. Uh, every, every large construction uh, in the past, because this is obviously a legacy of decades of work of significant public policy, uh, they've, all of their um, neighborhoods include green spaces, community spaces, commercial spaces. Uh, and basically, this means that people from all walks of life, from all, at all income levels, except the very rich, have access to uh, an affordable, high-quality apartment in Vienna. And I think that's one good example, I hope Julieta will agree, of uh, an implementation of the right to housing. Uh, and, and this is a good example of where we should dream of Canadian cities to be in the future, uh, because it's about pulling everyone up and building cities for everyone. Uh, and it's a really, I think, a significant shift from building cities for uh, the profit of international investors. So I want to close off with uh, two last slides on how do we get there. Um, both collectively and individually as activists. Uh, so collectively first, well, I think we need to shift the discussion around uh, about around affordable housing and non-market housing to uh, have the target, formulate the goal that everyone deserves, not only the right to housing, that's the, that's the, the right, the international human rights uh, notion, but also the housing that this, transfers into, so a, a quality apartment at a fair price, uh, that's non-speculative. And shifting that discourse away from the current vision of social housing is for the very poor, and that we need to build, we need, because that's one of the problems we have in the public policy, even at the federal level right now, is sure, they want to build social housing, but if we only focus on saying, okay, let's build social housing for the very poor, and we maintain the rest of the housing market in its current speculative and for-profit structure, we're going to keep having the same problem. So uh, if we really want to shift our, um, our housing market, we need to have the goal to provide everyone with a non-speculative housing option. And this in involves, of course, governmental support at all orders of government and on lots of different fronts. Of course, it involves funding organizations there's a big shift since 2017 uh, with the federal government of Canada reinvesting in housing with the national housing strategy, which is the first time since the 90s. But the vast majority of those funds are going to for-profit developers. So basically, they're funneling more money into the same broken system that we just talked about how much it doesn't work. Uh, we need to prioritize 100% of those funds, ideally, going to non-market housing solutions. Uh, and we need to make sure that also goes into uh, transferring existing housing into non-market ownership structures and renovation and uh, environmental requalification so that we're not only trying to shift that into new construction, because I think we've heard how that's not sufficient, and also so that 
the funding of uh, eco renovation of buildings doesn't isn't operated as Julieta has said as in a for profit manner and just creating more distorted incentives for private profit. Uh, so that's one thing. But all governments have lots of different levers they can use to support the uh, increase in non market housing, and they can use incentives and no cost measures uh, through zoning, planification, fiscal measures. Uh, that I won't get into the details of, but there's lots of different uh, levers. And if we make this a social project that every order of government can contribute to, we can achieve significant change very quickly uh, because we do have, especially in Canada, which is a very privileged country, uh, we do have lots of levers to um, act on these issues. Uh, and finally, we also need more organizations uh, pushing this forward. Because the caveat to what I just said is if instantly uh, Justin Trudeau woke up tomorrow morning and was like, non-market housing, that's what I need to do for the next X years I'm in power. Um, to be fair, we don't have the uh, infrastructure and the capacity as a society to reorganize instantly around this notion of non-market housing. There's lots of groups, lots of activists, lots of advocates, um, but it's still a very marginal uh, reality, like I mentioned, and for every one uh, network of uh, non-market housing providers, there's 10 uh, private apartment owner uh, lobbies that are much better funded. So, uh, and, and, I, and I also wanted to give a very specific example, which is that in Canada, no one was uh, talking about affordable student housing or suggesting a way to build it before it was founded in 2012. So there's there, that's just one example out of all of the uh, other gaps we have in things we need to do, uh, approaches we need to uh, develop, and uh, the advocacy we need to achieve to get this really at the higher levels of government. Finally, individually, what can we do about this? Um, well, I'm going to start by stressing something that Julieta has already said, which is that we need to integrate housing and climate campaigns. Uh, as a personal side note, I actually got into housing as a climate activist myself. I went to study urban planning because I wanted to design more bike paths. But then when I realized how that housing is the bottom of the Maslow pyramid and basically connected to all of these other issues of social justice and climate justice, I moved away from bike paths and into uh, non-market housing and here and today. Um, so that's, I think, a very important message uh, that I wanted to stress. Uh, and we need to work with existing uh, social and housing advocacy groups because they are also unconnected from uh, environmental advocacy. And that's another problem. We need to connect housing advocacy and environmental advocacy. But sometimes we also need to create new groups, uh, create new organizations. And if you want to act on student housing, uh, please do get in touch with my organization. We'll be happy to support you. Uh, and finally, we do need to advocate for public funding, but we can also get creative in terms of funding sources. Uh, for example, some of our housing projects are funded by student unions that actually do have a capacity to raise some funding. And we take that money and we leverage that with public and private investors to build affordable housing. So. That was my uh, quick uh, overview of what I think are some of the solutions to the issues we've discussed. And I'm happy to say if uh, people have some uh, questions. Thank you so much, Laurent. That was, again, incredibly interesting. And really, you, you were diving into topics that I find truly fascinating. So, so thank you for that. Um, I am seeing a lot of questions in the chat. So first of all, maybe we could start, give you a little break and, and give you a chance to, to get a glass of water. And we can start maybe with um, Julieta, who, were, who um, was mentioning that she'll clarify the conversation on supply after your presentation. So um, Julieta, feel free to, to go ahead. For sure. And I just, I want to thank Lauren. That was a really, really amazing presentation. I think it, it tied together really well um in giving us such concrete solutions i think uh as far as the issue of supply i think what i wanted to stress is what we saw in the elections is all of the political parties suggesting that they were going to build supply without adequate regulation so one of the things that's so important about what Laurent is saying is as 
a, a solution in non-market housing is that it would remain affordable in perpetuity and it would remain affordable as a cornerstone of future generations being able to enjoy that housing. What we currently have now is, I'm not suggesting we don't need any supply at all. I do think we need supply. I think that there is in uh, some uh, structures a, a housing shortage. So for example, for low-income families, there is a housing shortage for low-income families for, for units that have two or three or four bedrooms. But we can't just say that the government is going to build a million units without regulating what those units are going to look like, how many bedrooms they're going to have, and what income margin they're going to be for, and how long they're going to remain affordable. Currently, when we fund affordable housing projects in Canada, they remain affordable for at most 20 years. And 20 years isn't very long. So what we need is a extremely deeply affordable housing in perpetuity if we're truly going to shift our understanding of housing from a commodity to that of a human right. I also think if you think we have 1.6 million or 1.7, actually, we have 1.7 million households living in core housing need, we're going to need to get far more creative than just building housing units. We won't be able to do that and, and maintain our carbon emissions to the level that they need to be at. What we need to do is get governments to audit our, our building structures, get governments to audit our residential housing market, get governments to audit our commercial markets to understand what is available in the stock and what we can do in the most climate friendly way possible. We, we have spoken to a lot of governments about building housing stock that is um, low in carbon emissions. And they all say the exact same thing. We can't afford it. We won't do it. We can't afford it. And that's a huge problem, you know, that, I mean, if governments are going to build housing stock that's low emission, but that's only for middle to high income households, then we're not going to be able to solve the affordability crisis or the housing crisis or the homelessness crisis that we have in this country. So we need to make sure that we're holding government's feet to the fire to, to really probe these numbers that they're always putting forward and to move past the supply and demand argument, which, which doesn't work. And I can say one of the things I've, I've had the pleasure to go to the city of Vienna. I've had the pleasure of speaking to the mayor there and their housing, uh, their, their city housing department. And they are all very clear that housing in Vienna is a human right, that we need to keep investors outside of housing and that everybody in the city of Vienna has the right to live not only not only in a house but in a house that's nice that's sustainable that's that they can pass down to their their children so there's a lot of like very different paradigms in the way that Vienna views housing than in the way that we view housing here and i will just say very quickly i think there was a question about foreign investment uh, that somebody had uh, according to some of our leading uh, urbanists in Canada, they seem to find that foreign investment isn't actually affecting housing prices. It's a bit of a red herring. What's affecting housing prices is investors. So whether they're Canadian or foreign, that's what's affecting our housing prices. So the fact that all of the parties have come out saying that they, they want to regulate foreign investments, including the Liberals, it's a bit of a red herring. What we need to do is regulate investors in our housing markets. And I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you Flate, for clarifying that. That's um, super helpful information. I see, Lohana, you have your hand up. I don't know if you had a comment to, to reply to that. Yeah, can I just add to that, that um, I think we have to see, uh, to go one step further, one step closer to the ground from the discussion around supply and to add to the right to housing, the right to the city. Uh, because the the implication of a purely supply driven solution to the housing crisis is that we're going to build more housing everywhere, and at always for profit for profit trying to reach the highest margins, and some people will find a place they can afford. But the result of that is that you have neighborhoods that are that price people out, and. You're not you're not giving uh, low income households a choice. You're just basically deregulating because that's the only supply solution that we hear from private developers. 
uh, to build where it's the cheapest and the cheapest options. And that's what you're going to be able to afford while respecting for profit developers' profits. Uh, and in the in in the downtown or central boroughs, they're going to keep building uh, condo towers that are not accessible. There's no there's no amount of new condo construction that you can build that will trickle down housing to uh, low income households. I'll say it this way: housing doesn't trickle down. You have to wait decades for it to be run down before an absentee landlord allows the rents to uh, to stabilize. And with the amount of institutional investors which we're seeing in the housing market now, that's just never going to happen anymore until that changes. So we have to just remove the notion of trickle down economics from our vision of housing and realize that what you build is what you get. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for adding those points. And there's actually another question for you, Laurent. Um, from one of our participants, he mentions everything you say makes sense, but how do you get the private investors who provide about 60% of your funding? Is it through social bonds at a fixed interest rate? And what rate do you give? Yeah, I was actually, uh, I had begun typing my answer to Alan in the Q&A box, uh, but I'll give it uh, verbally. Uh, so, of course, a, a very uh, typical form of private investment we get is mortgage loans through banks, which is very traditional uh, form of finance. We typically use the CMHC uh, Affordable Housing Mortgage uh, Insurance Program, but that's never enough to fund entire uh, entire projects. So we've actually set up multiple investment funds for uh, non-market student housing. The bigger uh, one of them attracts pension funds, and we do provide them a stable uh, level of return over that's over inflation. Um, but that's much lower, obviously, than they would get on short-term flips on the private uh, housing market. Uh, they can hope to make 15%, 20% on a successful condo project where we pay some investors 6 7%. Uh, and our typical term is around 15 years. Um, and it's simply refinanced through uh, mortgage refinancing. So... The, the goal is to only accept uh, investments that are non-speculative and not tied to actual rental incomes. Perfect. Thank you. We actually, um, I see in the questions that we have another question from Alan. He mentions the other questions in re-private investors. What is the typical term for the investment and how is the capital paid back to the investor when the bonds term is up? Uh, yeah, so... For, for uh, mortgages right now, loans can be 25, 30 years. It's actually interesting because on the private market, increasing um, mortgage terms just bumps uh, prices up, which is a significant problem. But in the non-market housing sector, it's actually really nice to have a longer mortgage because you can transfer that lower annual payment into lower rents directly. So. We always take the longest mortgage terms we can, and otherwise our, our more mezzanine or patient capital partners are generally in for 15 years. Perfect, thank you. And I think we'll end with our last question from Andrew, who's mentioning that Singapore is another good example of public housing, public housing and high quality units and quality of life. So how can we implement more public co-op and nonprofit units in Canada? Um, government regulations and getting people to change view from housing as an investment to a human right. So, um, yeah, maybe Julieta, you you can answer that one. I mean, that's something that we're banging our head against the wall. That answering that question is is constantly on our minds. I think, uh, I mean, one of the approaches that we're taking is I know that a lot of local governments are really keen on re-entering the housing market and acting as housing providers. So I think in this country, what we need to overcome is a little bit the federalism and the federal structure of Canada. So I think part of the solution is in striking intergovernmental tables around housing and addressing the housing crisis. Um, the federal government has been obviously has adopted the National Housing Strategy Act. They've recognized that housing is a human right but they haven't actually done as much as they need to do in ensuring that the provinces and the local governments know what that means 
And if they do know what that means, they're often not supported enough to actually be able to implement housing as a human right. So for example, um, the city of Toronto has around 9,000 people living in homelessness. And the government by recognizing housing as a human right, they've also recognized that they need to urgently address homelessness and eliminate it but they haven't actually worked with the city of Toronto to do that. So if the city of Toronto can't address homelessness, how is the federal government expected to meet its obligations? So that is gonna be a huge issue, intergovernmental cooperation. And then I think really urging the federal government to regulate private actors in our, in our housing sectors. The, the federal government currently gives tax breaks to real estate investment trusts. Real estate investment trusts, as Lauren said, they, they make their profits out of our rent and they try to extract as much profit as possible from tenants and they uh, file for evictions at a higher rate than private landlords. They up rents at a higher rate than pub private landlords and they're usually behind a lot of the rent evictions that are happening. So the federal government could reduce all or eliminate all tax incentives for real estate investment trusts that are currently working in Canada. And that would actually go a long way in trying to help address some of the unaffordability issues. So there's a lot of things that can be done, but I think it starts with really the federal government and then all orders of government understanding what it means to implement housing as a human right and what that means for them and the role that they have to play to secure public housing, to incentivize um, non-market housing options. I'll leave it there. Let's... <laughs> Thank you so much. That Again, I'm repeating myself, but that was incredibly interesting. Thank you both for answering all of these amazing questions. Thank you to the participants for, for engaging in this important discussion. Um, I think we'll end it there as it, as, as it is getting a little bit late, but um, thank you everyone for participating. It was really interesting. And if you do want to keep up with kind of what's happening with our week of action, feel free to head to the Climate Reality website. Um, but again, thank you. Any last words, Laurent and Julieta? No, I'll just say thank you for your work, everyone. And uh, it was a pleasure being here. Thanks for the yeah. invitation. Ditto. Thank you so much. Amazing. Well, have a great night, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.